welcome to the opening of the course of the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics 2014-2015. We are very pleased to have Parta das Gupta, Sir Parta das Gupta, with us. He's a leading economist who has been in the forefront, and I said, looking far before many people started thinking about these issues on the environment, on the, on the resources. His work on these areas has been pioneering. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here, and obviously I'm addressing students who are about to embark on a, a PhD, the a master's program, and I'm going to be talking about one part of the program to do with public policy. And um, what I want to sketch before you, there are plenty of published papers that you can look at and you, if you're so inclined. But I wanted to give a feel for how to do or how to think theoretically towards problems which you face on a daily basis. The connection between economic theory and daily life is something that I feel is really worth pursuing, because otherwise there's not much point, at least for me, to do academic economics unless it can speak to our experiences. Now when I say <clears throat> our experiences, it's personal experiences of course, but when you think of public policy, you think about collective experiences, because in some sense you're trying to aggregate the experiences of people in the group who's, uh, about whom you're concerned. And this collective experience, there are two types of questions you typically ask, or one can typically ask. One is, how are we doing now as compared to last year or the year before? So it's an it's a attempt at asking a question of the quality of life of a group of people, and that's for, for convenience, I'm going to think of groups as nations here now, but this question can go from the family size right up to the world order. How are we as humanity doing? You can ask that question. But I'll be thinking in terms of a nation. And you're asking the question as to how the economy is progressing, the nation is progressing. People as a collective whole, in some sense, are doing. Is it better off this year than it was last year? Is it likely to be better next year than it is this year? Or uh, worse? So it's a comparison across time as the economy moves through time. So that's one class of questions. Another class of questions is to do with pol direct policy, which is, suppose we do this rather than that, is it likely to make the economy, the experience of the people better? So deciding on whether or not to construct a building, whether to um, break, uh, to d destroy a, uh, wetland in order to build a road. A bad thing on the one hand, the wetland is destroyed, but a good thing on the other, which is the road. That kind of question that you ask is to do with public policy, tax policies and so forth, and you're asking whether the change that would be brought about by that action is likely to be good or is it likely to be bad. So there are these two types of questions. One is a change at any moment in time as a consequence of an action that is taken by whoever you're studying, and one which is to do with changing uh, of experiences across time, as the economy moves through time under uh, policies that have been enacted. Now you might think that these two questions are very different. In fact, it can be shown that they are the same question, which is nice. You want to, if you're an economist, you want to economize. You don't want to have too many things to do. You want to somehow reduce them to something similar. Turns out it's the same question, and the question then arises, you're interested in some kind of a measured sense of collective experience, what is that measure likely to be? Now currently, there is no question that in our general um, place as citizens, the measure that we use is almost univer universally uh, concerned with flows of things. GDP is, of course, the most classic example. It's a flow. So many euros per year. 
So that's the way you measure it. Now, the, the fact that it's euro doesn't matter. It could be in dollars, it could be in apples, it could be in any object you like. But the idea is that it's some measure of the total bundle of goods and services that are produced at, a, over, at an instant of time, so per year. It's a flow. There are others, other measures that have been introduced in order to, to compensate for its weaknesses, as to weaknesses as to whether it's actually measuring what we are interested in measuring, which is life's experiences, the collective experience, collective well-being. Some people think in terms of happiness, for example, or welfare. I want to keep those issues slightly outside. I'm going to use the word experiences, because I think that just does the right thing, because that's what we actually experience in our lives. Sensations of some kind, approval, disapproval, and so forth. The fact that GDP has weaknesses has been much commented on. So a number of alternative indicators have been suggested. For example, the most prominent is the United Nations Development uh, UNDP Development um, Program, called the, uh, the, the Human Development Index, which is a combination of GDP and then things that matter to us, which is health and education. Knowledge and education, those things matter. Somehow you feel, yes, those things should be included because you could have GDP rising even at the expense of things like health and education, and that trade-off doesn't look right, so you should include those. And that's what HDI does. <coughs> now the problem is that each of these moves that have been suggested by international organizations, every one of them is what would one would call ad hoc. They have no systematic basis for inclusion. They're included because you feel something is missing, so we should include it. The question is, how do we consistently construct an index which is going to be measurable, which will be usable, and at the same time corresponds to what it is we are really after, which is life's experiences or human well-being? It's that question that I'll be addressing here. I won't prove the theorem, obviously, uh, it's a very easy theorem, by the way. I should tell you that it's probably the easiest theorem you will, in your years here, will learn of, should you learn of it. The trick wasn't in proving it. That, that's the easy bit. I think the trick lay in asking the question, which is, what would correspond to human experiences? And guess what? The answer is wealth. Now, you might say that's a deflationary answer because, after all, our subject began with Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, so he must have got it. Well, he didn't get it, but never mind. The notion of wealth here that I want to talk about is a very inclusive one. You're asking, I'll give you the theorem in a minute, but the idea is I'm giving you, I'm working backwards. I'm giving you the index first, and then I'm going to show how the index works with what I'm... Okay. Of course, that's fine. Thank you. Wealth is a measure of the assets of the entity that you are studying. So if you ask yourself household wealth, you ask what does the household own in terms could be property, uh, Typically, in the household's case, it would be property, the houses, and the, and, the, and the property that it owns in the forms of stocks and shares. But they have access to goods and services. That's one. Then, of course, it's human capital, the knowledge and skills embodied in the members of the household, which will have an earning profile over time. For an economy, we also want to include in the notion of assets. Actually, you should include anything which is an asset. So that's the first step. Okay? And by an asset, you mean a durable good. Okay, so if, and the durable good may be offering you consumption services, but it could be services which are useful for productivity gains. That doesn't matter. That's simply to say that it has two values, two worths. That's okay. So by asset, I mean anything durable. But not all durable goods. We, now remember, we want to have a measure 
So we want to be also practical and see not about cutting corners. That's not the issue. I'm not yet going to cut corners. But the idea is to see what, what makes sense. So I want to begin by showing you, I'm going to, this is the breakdown I'm suggesting here, produced capital, which is of course the kind of capital assets that people think about when they think of the wealth of nations, roads, building, machinery, and equipment. Human capital now is very much part and parcel of the economist's understanding of capital assets. It's a great achievement of the 1960s, 70s, 80s that human capital, estimation of human capital has progressed considerably. Uh, it includes, of course, population, size and composition, knowledge and skills, which is education, health. Uh, health, by the way, you will find is not usually included in human capital, but that's a mistake. Obviously, it should be included. Quality, uh, it's, it's, it has at least several virtues, health, enhances quality of life, extends life, uh, lo longevity, that is, and uh, productivity gains, and so forth. And I want to think about natural capital, which is, of course, what led me to think in terms of uh, the wealth measure. Ecosystem, subsoil resources. Now, these days, of course, pretty much anything which is durable is taken to be an asset. Sometimes we talk about re religious capital, social capital, cultural capital, and so forth. We're not going to measure them. They're, I'm going to call them enabling assets. If these capital, the institutions are good, one to four, under enabling assets, I'm sorry, one to three, if they're good institutions, then they enable the allocation of the capital assets under type one, produced human and natural capital, to be better. It's a very intuitive notion. You may have the same structure of capital assets in a malfunctioning economy, and nothing much will happen. Whereas in those same assets took, were in a country which, has, which is well ordered in some sense, they will find the assets will be allocated in a way which enhances the quality of life of people. So the enabling assets in some sense give the background environment in which the first three types of assets find themselves allocated. And the trick is to hypothesize or forecast what the enabling assets are likely to be in the future forecast into the future, and then work backwards to value the first three types of capital assets. If you can do that, that's going to give you a measure of the wealth. Two points. First of all, one thing you will learn as you move through your um, master's program is that we economists love optimization. And you'll be thinking, you'll be taught about Optimization techniques, which is absolutely essential, by the way. No question about that. But I want you to think beyond that. You, we want a theory. We want an account which can be used even in Sierra Leone or Zambia. Because if the theory doesn't work there, then it's no good. It's not good because you want it to be applying not only to Norway, but also elsewhere. And the theory I'm giving you now does that. So these enabling assets, institutions, I'm not supposing that they're optimal. So when you do an optimization exercise in public policy, the way to think about what I've, the classification I've given you is that the institutions are working perfectly. And then you will be as estimating wealth in that nation. But now suppose you are in Sierra Leone or some arbitrary country which you can think of, which is, at least in your judgment, is not exactly where you would like to be at the moment. Then, even there, you should be able to do public policy, because there will be always people like you sitting there with some degree of choice, maybe in a government office with a project which has been handed over and saying, well, do you think it's a good idea? And that person needs support. He needs an intellectual, or she needs an intellectual framework with which to ask, is it worthwhile? What I'm t talking about now enables you to do that. Because the institutions may be bad, but you have made that forecast. You've got the, pro uh, the projection of that institution. And then you're asking yourself, what is the value of the first three types of assets in that society? You can always ask that. You can always ask, what is the worth 
of yet another tractor in this economy, given the fact that the tractor will be usurped by the cousin of the ruler and, and so forth and so on. You can track that entire consequence of your, your judgment of the politics of the economy to work backwards to see what the value is, okay? So that's the, what I mean by the wealth of nations. So wealth will be the social value in terms of individual experiences, collective experiences of the first three types. Now, what does it do for us? In fact, I'm, I'm going to cut very short and say I'm going to be thinking of wealth per capita, normalizing it for two, one population. Of course, you can talk about the distribution of wealth as well. All that can be discussed. But here, for our purposes, for the next 10 minutes that I have, we'll be thinking of uh, wealth per capita. Because I just don't have the data for many countries about distribution, never mind. You don't have GDP distribution, let, I mean, the distribution of income, let alone the wealth. Okay, now the main theorem is this. You have a notion of collective experiences in the form of, say, collective well-being or collective happiness. You name the social objective, and there corresponds a set of values of these first three types of assets, given enabling assets, your forecast of it, such that if you estimate the social worth of those first three types of assets, produced human and natural, divide by population, so you have wealth per capita, then wealth per capita does the following thing. If it goes up over time, then collective well-being will have increased over time. And it's an if and only if statement. It's a necessary and sufficient condition state. It's, it's a theorem. And simultaneously, if a public policy increases wealth, then and then only does social welfare or well-being increase. So it's also a method by which you can do cost-benefit analysis. Now you might say, that's odd, because even in school we learned that when you do cost-benefit analysis, you should discount the flow of net benefits. Discount it to the present, take the present discounted value of benefits, <coughs> and if that's positive, it's a good project. If it's negative, reject it. I think you're probably familiar with that rule. Well, it turns out, and that's another theorem, that the present discounted value of a project, if you're using the right prices, that is, is the same as the change in the wealth brought about by the project. So the thing that you've been measuring all, this, all these years and you will be encouraged to measure in your courses is really a wealth calculation. Remember, the present discounted value is a stock, a change in a sum stock because you are adding up these flows, the net benefits, right, with a discount rate. So it's a stock. The question is, what is a change of, it's changing what stock? And the answer is, it's wealth. Okay, so that's the end of the theorem. So we have a nice result because you're moving from a general notion of well-being to a me potentially measurable object index based on things that you can actually value ecosystems, trees, buildings, education, a degree from the University of Barcelona. In three years' time, your human capital would have jacked up considerably, I can assure you as an international scholar, it's, and it's worth a lot. So it's telling us to look at these objects which we can measure and then show how it's related to what we really ideally want to measure. Okay, so now in the next six minutes, I'm going to give you a case study. I'm, uh, this is a paper published with, that I co-published with Kenneth Arrow, uh, Larry Goulder, and um, uh, two graduate students who are now, Kevin Mumford and uh, um, Chris Nolson. Um, it came out two years ago, so I'm going to give you the figures I'm not going to explain too much, except, sorry, let me just say that on human capital, we look at education earnings and life expectancy, value of life, ex increases in life expectancy, and in natural capital, we look at subsoil resources, timber, and carbon concentration. So it's a very big underestimation. It does not include anything 
of ecosystem services and so forth. At the moment, we don't have any data on that. I should say this is a long-term research program, not to be carried out by us because we are getting old, but it has to be done because it's the right way to shift national accounts away from flows. And doesn't mean that flows should be ignored. It's just that the flows are not going to give you the answer to the questions you typically they're used to answer because of the theorem I've already given you. It has to be well. So we want to look at here, I'm looking at the sustainability issue. What, does, what did India look like between these five years, between 1995 and 2000? So we are tracking the economy over time, and we are using wealth per capita as a way of tracking it. So you have to estimate the wealth. In 1995, measure it in 2000, look at the change, which is column three, and then if you wish to put it in percentage terms, do it on the column four. This is exactly what happens if you did GDP. You would be estimating GDP in 1995, you'd be estimating GDP in 2000, you would look at the change, and then you would ask at what percentage on average was it moving over the five years. Now, I'm just going to give you the first column. It is a remarkable set of numbers. It's a remarkable, I hope you think it's remarkable. If you don't, it's because you haven't got experience with these numbers not because you can't see something remarkable. It's remarkable because it's telling us, look at the f figures, it's stocks. We have estimated the stocks, right? Reproducible capital, one, uh, uh, 1,530 per capita, per person. This is, these are per capita terms. Okay. Well, per capita wealth, remember. Same order of magnitude as education. But notice, education is about what? Four times as much, which is, should be pleasing surprise pleasantly surprising to us around in this room, because we are saying that human capital, if just, just look at the education side of things, is worth more per capita. Or in the, even India had more per capita education, or human capital, uh, four times as reproducible capital. Now that should switch your mind away from the stuff that we always take to be the sign of progress. But this is not so innovative because other people had noticed it too. People who have worked on human capital have pointed out that in the United States, the bulk of the assets of the United States lies in its, the education, the, the human capital, not so much the building. But look at health. It's three orders of magnitude above. It's absolutely stunning. And the question is why? The reason is what we are doing is to ask the question, we are looking at the value of life if you value the extension of life, which you do, people spend enormous amounts of money extending it by six minutes, six months, one, one year, and so forth. Then that's something that matters to us. When we talk about life experiences, apparently that matters a lot to us. And what we've done is to have used the value of a statistical life to estimate that part of it. Having said that, human capital, health that is, is underestimated assuming that the value of statistical life is the right way of doing it. I mean, you can have a discussion on that. It's an underestimate because we are not including in, the, in health two things that health does for us. One, it makes us feel better. Not being ill is a nice experience. Or put it this way, being ill is a bad experience. The flow of utility, if you like. We don't feel happy. And the other is, of course, we are more productive if we're healthy. I'm not that they're not being included because we don't have data on that. It was very difficult to find data even on this. So, but now look how much more valuable, I mean, health seems to be, at least at this level of discussion. Natural capital, we, we did, as I, suggest, as I said, we carbon concentration, which is, of course, a negative price. We used figure of $50 per ton. For timber and subsoil resources, I won't go into that, it's 2,300. Total, $510,250 international dollars per person. We did the same thing in 2000, stocks, and then we took, looked at the change, and the growth rate was 0.2%. If you com compare it with GDP per capita growth rate in India, which was approximately 5.5%, you can see the increase, the rate of percentage change was very low. And given the margin of error that's involved in these estimations, 
0.2% could easily have been negative for all we know, particularly given that so many of natural capital assets were missing in the data, and they may, come, they may have well, there's good reason to believe they have deteriorated. We didn't have data on that. Countries don't even collect data on stocks, let alone valuing them. That's a real big, big, big uh, error that countries make. Now, I won't bother the next two uh, lines, eight and nine. Technological change is usually um, measured, the improvements in technological change are usually measured in terms of total factor productivity growth, something that you will have already come across. If not, you will come across it a lot in your master's program. I won't go into it. The total factor productivity growth rate over these five years in India was estimated as 1.84%. So if you add that to the wealth by saying the quality of wealth had increased at that rate, then wealth per capita increases as 2.04%. However, you're the brilliant young people about to enter onto the master's program. You should always be suspicious of economists making claims. So and that doesn't mean that they're naughty. It's just that you don't have time to do all the qualifications necessarily. So one of the tasks of a student should be always critically, but sympathetically, because the economists are not stupid, and they're not trying to cheat you. It's just that they may, may have missed out something which you see. Now, TFP growth is universally used to judge the improvements in the efficiency of an economy and the increase in knowledge, and is always added to uh, whatever figure that you're using to judge the, the performance of countries. It's very bad practice, and the reason is this. The way TFP is the growth is calculated, the models on the basis of which they're calculated do not include natural capital. No, I have not seen a single model which has done it. So, and I won't go any further, I'm gonna read that to you as a puzzle that tonight, this afternoon, if you're really energized, you will go and try and make sense of what I'm saying. If there is a missing item in the production function with which you are estimating TFP, and if that missing pipe item goes down over the five-year period, then your TFP estimate on the wrong model will be biased upward. And since we don't know how far it went down, you don't know whether 1.84 is actually a negative number. You could have TFP growth as estimated properly, could have been negative, even though it's showing up positive and everybody's very happy. Because gosh, people know more, the economy is somehow more, the institutions are better, and so forth. Not true. You've got to use the right model. And the right model, growth models do not include natural capital in them, and so you can easily have these anomalies. Okay, so that's, that's it. Now, I want to we give one final, if I may, from the chair, I've just got to 25 minutes, but I'd like one or two minutes more for a final thing, because I've tried to give you a sense of how to think about public policy, the core ideas behind public policy, through the notion of wealth, that it can be done. But at the end of the day, however, there's one thing that bothers me a lot, and it should bother you, which is you will never hear a prime minister or a president of any nation say that we can really take nature seriously, because if we want to penalize projects on the basis of the environmental harms it can do, and, if, and the projects will not be accepted if we value the environmental harm properly, that is to say that it'll be assumed that the project is actually contributing to decline in wealth, or, then I don't want to be a prime minister during my tenure because it would jeopardize growth of GDP and it'll increase unemployment, and I can't. That's not, not in my, my, uh, during, uh, my, my uh, service time. And it's a very reasonable worry for politicians. Because one thing we know from the work of sociologists and anthropologists and our own reading of life is that unemployment is a terrible thing. It's not the same as saying that reduction in GDP is a terrible thing, but unemployment is a terrible thing. 
And that's because our macroeconomic models have so tightened the grip, the connection between output, aggregate output, and aggregate employment, that to reduce one, you inevitably have to reduce the other, or you think, or the institutions are such, that you have to reduce the other. And the other is unacceptable. If you say to yourself, here's a set of policies which is going to reduce unemployment by another 10%, increase unemployment by 10%, that would be really bad, unthinkable. But if somebody says consumption will be reduced by 10%, what would you think? You might think that's terrible, because of course that's what, you, you know, if a public policymaker will be saying 10% reduction in GDP is absolutely ghastly. Look what has happened since 2008. We have been so concerned about it, rightly so too. But I believe mostly we are worried about it because of the employment effect. And the reason I can't believe that it's due to the consumption effect is that 10% lower consumption per capita was experienced only the other day, five years ago, six years ago, 10 years ago. Now, are we to believe that the average person in Spain was very much unhappier in 1995 than he or she was in 2005? It's very unlikely. And the reason is that we, because relative consumption matters to us. What others are enjoying, if our consumption relative to our neighbors is reduced, we feel bad. But if we all have a bit lower consumption, we may not feel that bad. So I leave this open to you. That is, the clash between GDP growth and wealth growth, which is what I've tried to suggest happens here is one where the GDP growth wins all the time at the expense of wealth and therefore natural capital for a very understandable reason, because we think GDP is connected intrinsically with employment, and that worries us rightly. But if macroeconomists somehow manage to come up with an institutional framework where the two are delinked, then I believe the clash that we observe between the desire for growth interpreted in terms of GDP and the desire for growth in terms of human well-being, that clash will be reduced. Thank you very much.